Being able to practice frameworks of like anti-oppressive relationships with ourselves and practicing trauma-sensitive relationships with ourselves allow us to be able to practice it with each other. And we build the macro. So the way our nervous system functions builds how we then create every other relationship organizationally, etc. There's 7 billion humans on earth. There's 14 billion hands to do the work of undoing the disconnection which brings us to the now of instant gratification and perpetual forgetfulness. The disease of loneliness is spreading like an epidemic that leaves a single tree standing where there was once a forest. Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, Licensed Professional Counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Morgan Vanderpool. We talk about trauma, both personal and collective and societal trauma. What is survivorship from trauma? Survivorship from systems of oppression. What are these systems of oppression and how do they affect us in our nervous systems and how this is all baked into the history of the United States and the current geopolitical, economic, social, cultural situation that we find ourselves in right now. We will also go into detail about the autonomic nervous system, learning about that and how this is affected by all of the things I've mentioned, as well as solutions for both the personal self and people that are trying to make a difference in the collective. Thanks so much for listening. I'm sure you'll enjoy this episode with Morgan Vanderpool. Who is Morgan Vanderpool? They are a white, non-binary, queer, bilingual, Spanish and English, and multicultural clinical social worker, trauma-sensitive movement and breath facilitator, professional trainer, and activist. They are deeply committed to neuroscientifically grounded and mycelially guided embodiment practices that support our collective disengagement from white body supremacy and which foster for anti-oppressive and trauma-sensitive connection with every breath, movement, choice, thought, and word. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Stay tuned for the interview. Is moving towards the Milky Way at 250,000 miles per hour, a speed that would get us to the moon in just under an hour. We won't be there when they collide. Our sun will long have faded, but when they do, they will be mirrors of what we used to do. When love dipped into the divine, before the divide in us was more than the great pretending of current human history. Change. Change is constant, like the universe is expanding. All right, Morgan Vanderpool, welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm so happy to have you on today. Hello, hello. Buenos dias. Good to be here. Awesome. Buenos dias to you as well. Um, I'm very excited for everyone to hear what you have to say because I heard your interview on Chris Talks uh, from Chris Blunt's podcast, which is available online. And we have been good friends for 15 years and I just loved the interview. And I think I might have listened to it twice. And I said, oh my gosh, I need to interview this person immediately. So I texted Chris and then he hooked me up the information and then we've been going back and forth until then. So that's the the backstory because you are on the West Coast right now. That is true. In Washington. And uh, I'm interviewing you from the Midwest, which is partially where I live. Um, So I am excited to jump in here because... Your website is so full of information that I, and it was just the way you speak and write is in this concise manner of taking lots of information and putting it together. And that's why I thought you'd be a fabulous guest. And people really want to know because I get a lot of questions and emails about trauma uh, for this, from this podcast. And I get a lot of uh, hits to our website about the trauma-informed counseling center. What is trauma? What's happening to me? How do I get therapy for trauma? How did this trauma happen? What are the the roots of my depression? What are the roots of my anxiety? How did I get PTSD besides this? I feel like it's worse than that. Um, And I think 
one of the things I was noticing about your work is it's like trauma in context, um, the context of it. And I think that I was noticing how I was talking to people and I was like, oh my gosh, when they finally figured out that they had trauma or PTSD or something related to that in a nervous system way and their body was out of whack, they had, they finally felt heard and they finally felt like, um, they didn't have to just hang on to some diagnosis that they could fully embody what was going on and they could recover and find a way to live better and not suffer as much, uh, or at least cope with the suffering. But when I heard your explanation, it felt like like a mothership landed over top of my explanation, and it was like, <laughs> I was serious. It was like, I was like, you know, trauma. You got to understand that. And it's like, and there, everyone's like, oh my god, the roots of all my diagnosis are are this trauma in my body, and I got to make friends with my body, and I got to learn how to express all this, right? And then you're like, yeah, but wait a minute, how did this trauma occur in like the larger socio political economic context of our planet? And I was like, what? what are you talking about? And then I was, so that's kind of where we're going. If people can understand that, like my, like other trauma podcasts, it's like a bubble and you're like landed something on top of that. I didn't know. I mean, I knew it existed, but I didn't know how to articulate it. Like I I had studied them as separate things. Um, And so I kind of want to ask you a little bit about your experience, just understanding trauma and then getting into some of the social cultural context of it. Sure. Um, I think maybe, hi y'all, this is Morgan. Um, and, uh, I think one thing, um, maybe from my deep dedication to anti-oppressive lens, um, I would hope that maybe like, instead of being like a mothership that landed on top of you, that it might be a little bit more like a really wonderfully uh, woven mycelial network that came up to support you, um, to like be able to, to be able to hold all the different moving pieces that come together for our survivorship of trauma. I'm good with Um, that. I'm good with that. I just have an obsession with UFOs dating back to childhood. So we'll just go with that. I did. I did. I did get the like feeling though that happens when you're like, Whoa, what happens when I take into consideration the origins of things? Yes. So we're practicing telling like an origin story. Um, when, you know, creating more of an inclusive space for like all the different layers of the ways that we've survived, like the, the way that systems of oppression come to intersect with one another to create environments in which violence is ripe to happen. Um, and so, um, I'm trying to decide kind of like a, a starting point. Um, I guess maybe a little bit about like how I arrived doing this work and kind of like the lens that I use, would that be helpful? Yeah, I think that would be great. Cool. Um, so I, uh, I have been um, like keenly, keenly interested in always asking why questions throughout my entire life. Like why do things happen? Um, and I think that lens has based off of the opportunity of having been able to grow up along the West coast of the United States. Um, become bilingual in Spanish and English at a pretty early age and to live in places in which um, there was a very clear story of the impact of the ways that um, U.S. imperialism created systems of poverty and created systems of of, so many words that are trying to come in at the same time, so I'm trying to choose which one to say. Um, created context in which, in which violence had a higher propensity of happening, both in communities, interpersonally, um, system to system. And I'm really grateful that kind of like my, my protected upbringing of being a white bodied person got kind of busted at a pretty early age, um, by being able to relate cross linguistically and cross racially, um, and mix that, I think with, um, always having been a queer and non-binary person without a lot of access to being able to be seen in that. So both mixing my, my personal understanding of how being unseen, unheard, and invalidated by, by, by systems of power and privilege um, mixed with being able to see how the country that I was supposed to call home um, perpetuates a shit ton of harm. Um, so 
I think that, um, that mixed with my, like always being really curious as to why things happen led me to figure out, okay, so like what kind of job could I have where I could be of greatest, of greatest service to the highest level of suffering? Maybe that's a byproduct of white saviorism. That's always a question I'll hold, but the way that it's turned out has led me layer by layer through my fascination with the way that bodies work, with the way that relationships get created, with the ways that um, economy and politics work, the way that history plays out in, in our bodies and our relationships to step into a career in social work. I thought I wanted to be a surgeon, but when they told me that you couldn't see your first quote unquote patient until you were 30, I was like, fuck that shit. I want to get in there. <laughs> um, I wish on a podcast you could see nonverbals, but you can't. We're having. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you know. Uh, I could always funny. put the video up. I just I usually don't because I'm yeah. like jotting down notes and like we scratching my beard or something. Uh, I'm just letting the audience know that we're having a body to body conversation of like yeah, some resonance. Um, so that led me into wanting to be of service in the social work field, and I at 22. Um, I'm gonna offer kind of like a one of the things that like hit me really hard at a very young age um, in this career, like holding babies that in the foster care system that had been radically abused by their parents, that tenacity for wanting to know why, like, why does this level of, of violence exist human to human? And it's just kind of like, hola tras hola, like wave after wave, um, invited me to a deeper understanding around like how systems of violence establish themselves. Um, and then what are the ramifications and like how our bodies have adapted, um, primarily our nervous system, how that's wired our brain. Um, and then how, yeah, how our bodies communicate. So, um, and how our bodies heal. It's kind of a roundabout. Yes. Mountainous this trail of <laughs> how I got I think, where I got. I think it's great to, to understand kind of how you got here. But I think, you know, I, you're wondering where a starting point was. I think we should start with babies because it reminds me of Dr. Bruce Perry's work, the neurosequential model, starting with how children learn. And mm -hmm. if these children are in a learning place where they have high cortisol, uh, low availability to resources, um, parents that may be working too much or um, having problems financially or uh, imprisoned or in a violent relationship, how this starts from the very beginning of their life to set them up to fail in our system, in the United States system of, of what, what's going on and how it, it actually is wiring their minds and bodies to um, be all sorts of not good things, such as uh, more likely to be a victim of violence. I mean, we see this from the ACEs study. More likely to not understand um, or be able to have healthy eating habits. More likely to be obese. More likely to have chronic illnesses, chronic stress, toxic chronic, chronic stress. Then they're growing up possibly um, in little in areas and contexts where the schools may not be equally resourced. So starting right there. Uh, there is a, a traumatization or a traumatizing to the human nervous system that's not safe um, from just, just a little baby. And then as the person grows up, they may have multiple troubles and then they're labeled by the systems um, as a problem in school, a problem here, a problem there. And and the older they get, the less empathy seems to be turned towards them. And, and sometimes not even that old. Sometimes eight years old, I hear um, you have children being over-medicated and institutionalized at eight years old. That's a, that's a stark, pathetic misunderstanding of science. That's a stark uh, misunderstanding of humanity. And it's an uh, it's a misunderstanding of family systems. It's a misunderstanding of biology, and yet we still have this going on all over the place in this country, everywhere. It's happening here where I live. I mean, the way that people speak about uh, foster children and things. But back to you. So I want to start with babies, but I know you had a lot of experience holding these babies. I had experience only when they were. I had experience in the foster system. Most of my kids were 10 to 18, so I dealt with that age group. But 
Well, I, I think a, a map that you're you're drawing within that explanation is that like everything that you're citing is to fa- how our bodies respond to being exposed to violence um, and the ways that we um, are hyper pumped with adrenaline and hyper pumped with cortisol and how that plays out into what parts of our brain we do and do not have access to moment to moment um, and our natural survival responses of being fight, flight, freeze, submit, and fawn. And you could possibly add fatigue as well, depending on what lens you're using. Um, That all of those sort of natural biological responses that you're talking about, you you cited as like a folks are getting misunderstood. We're being not seen as like biological beings responding to a toxic environment. That toxic environment has been created by institutions of power that continue to replicate patterns of, of racism patterns of designing um, cities and places to deny access to the resources that are necessary to be able to feel safe and feel connected. And so our our bodies are responding to the realities of of white body supremacy, of violent capitalism, of ongoing colonialism. Um, Those are the systems that then perpetuate who gets incarcerated and who doesn't who is given access to a job and who isn't. So our bodies are giving big old like alarm signals to say these systems are unjust, these systems are violent. But then because the way the systems interact, particularly like the way that the U.S. is built off of this false perception of hyper-individualism and hyper-productivity, that if your body is somehow not complying with those rules, you are the problem. Instead of saying, hey, the system is inherently violent and we are having a natural reaction to an incredibly violent system. And right now, like systems of education, healthcare, um, public health, all of us that are like sort of like aiming to be of service for restoration, for health, for all of that kind of stuff. Those of us that carry power within those systems, we are in a massive place to try to, to instigate a radical shift to putting the responsibility on those who have created the systems to be violent and no longer on the the survivor of the system of violence. Because when you put the responsibility on the survivor of the systems of violence, then it perpetuates a kind of like like pathologizing, uh, making other, diminishing, ridiculing, shaming your body's natural response to being invisibilized unseen, unheard, and crushed um, by systems of violence that have happened since the initiation of our country. And our country was initiated on violence. Um, And those who came over here were escaping violence, but also didn't take the time to figure out, do I want to maybe not replicate the patterns of violence that I was also victim to? No, let's just replicate them on the people that are here so that we can feel like we have a little bit more power. And then, boom. It just kept, ha- it, it's it's still in action. Yeah, it is. 500 plus years later. Well, if people don't have a little context, I got a couple comments. First of all, read the People's History of the United States, which is actual journal entries from the quote unquote explorers that came from Europe and what they did. These are journal entries, not only by them, but by clergy, uh, people from the Catholic Church that will literally write what they did to the quote unquote native people. That was like the nice term, the native people, but they, they called them other names. But for instance, my, Oh, my heart, Christopher Columbus day, quote unquote, indigenous people day was this last week. And Christopher Columbus, uh, one of the wonderful things he did was cut off children's hands. If they didn't bring him enough gold, that's just one of the stories you'll find in that book. Uh, this was brutal times and the brutal brutality was done on others that didn't look like them or or had land that they wanted and and so now it's playing out today we're 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 in this we're bathing in blood and essentially building our homes on the on the uh, ancestors graves of of all the native american tribes there's got to be repercussions for that then you you mentioned slavery so the people escaped religious persecution in europe uh the the colonies were founded in the u.s and then uh, they came over here and then uh, a group of them decided to, oh, well, I know, let's enslave these people. 
just, you know, let's suppress somebody else to make our economy grow uh, and to get our whatever we want. So it's still happening, but it's it's more clandestine now in terms, uh, depending where you look. I think the internet becoming so widely available has made people understand that it's still going on. But because the United States, if if there's one thing that we should be famous for it. We are the greatest marketing and storytellers of all time. Uh, we, <laughs> we can, we, it's not serious. Like, like if you go talk to somebody in the lens of the business world and they have been soaking in that bathtub their entire lives and their parents were in business and they're in business, they have no idea what you're talking about. They read textbooks on pure economics, pure numbers, which is, which I think from a therapist point of view is almost going into sociopathic tendencies as it's dissociative, right? It's dissociative. It's, it's contextless and numbers. The whole point of business is to in the business schools is not to create quality and equity anymore, especially here. It's to create the most amount of profit possible. And how do you do that? You shave into the workers earnings, you shit, you cut quality, you do anything you can to, cheapen what you're selling to get the most amount of cash, right? And that's kind of what we're living in right now. People have sort of woken up to the fact that most of the US, uh, I think what the, the billion, the, the, like seven or 10 billionaires own more than 95% of the United States population. And mm-hmm. like, so we're kind of going back into surfism, which was back in Europe before in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages before the settlers or whatever you want to call them, invaders, what it depends where you're coming from, came here on the boats. Uh, so we're bathing in that. And that context is important because all of this is still going on in different ways, and in, it, but with different language, different, so many postmodern different contexts of, of thought layered on top of this to mm-hmm. the point where your average person is mostly confused. Like you said, if your body's not complying, well, if your body's not complying, go to the gas station. What is mostly there? Sugar and caffeine, right? You've got to be productive. And then what do you do after work? If you're a laborer, then I see billboards for it. Buy the six pack of beer to slow down, right? Anyway, so I apparently just ranted, but I was trying to agree with you <laughs> that, you know, behind every need is or behind every behavior is a need and it starts with children they're acting out quote unquote in a way we don't like us adults don't like acting out is a way us adults don't like right they're needing something but they don't have the language to tell us right then they're labeled poorly instead of cared for more the same thing um the need of sleep and relaxation and vacation and the ability to have a roof over your head is becoming more and more scarce for most of the population in the US. I think it's like, I don't remember how, it's like 60 to 80% of people are one paycheck away from like a calamity. Like, mm-hmm. And then our vacation time in this US is two weeks. That's standard. If you have a salary job, <laughs> that's not a hourly laborer job. That's a whole other topic. So I think people don't want to look at that because well, we have Netflix. Means, we have the best movies taking, ever. It means taking responsibility. Taking responsibility and taking accountability, which means when those are done effectively, that's done from a place of empathy and a place of empathy. It means that I am able to like co-feel your reality with you. If I co-feel your reality with you, then that also means that I have to recognize that I may have, um, if I haven't been uh, victimized by systems of oppression very readily, or I've like not let myself feel the ways in which I've been victimized by systems of oppression, Um, I will then be hit with a wave of sensation that I have dissociated from in my own way of trying to get through um, the different ways in which capitalism and racism and transphobia, homophobia, sexism, misogyny play out on a day-to-day basis. Um, Similarly to saying, giving an invitation to folks um, to read the people's history of the United States. Um, If I'm not mistaken, I feel like it's written by a white author. Also want to highlight voices of color here. Um, in Paying Attention to My Grandmother's Hands, written by Resma Menicum, um, which does a beautiful job of being able to outline the history of um, the f- ways in which human brutalization begun and gets replicated. Um, and we can talk about some of those like manifestations as it happens in our bodies. 
um, as well as highlighting um, Dr. Joy DeGroy in her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, um, and being able to, to highlight the narratives that have been at minimum silenced and invisibilized um, in our country by functions of white body supremacy. Um, additionally, wanting to highlight um, a book called Conquest by Andrea Smith, um, Conquest, Sexual Violence, and American Indian Genocide. So knowledge is power in, in understanding like the origins of things. If we don't know the origins of things or where they come from, then we are going to be walking around pretty lost. And possibly repeating cycles. On Oh, very easily right. um, repeating cycles. One of the most powerful things that we can do is be able to, um, for lack of a better word, like normalize survivorship. Being able to like center what does it, feel like, mean, look like, sound like to live in a body that has survived violence. Um, mainstream cultural will want to like say that we are, um, you know, we're having like inappropriate reactions, that we're sick, that we are having, you know, like symptoms of some diagnosis where it's actually our nervous system saying like, yo, I don't feel safe. I feel unseen. I feel unheard. I feel unprotected. Um, and there's a variety of ways that our bodies kind of predictably um, give us those heads up. Um, so I think that's some place we could go, but I also recognize that um, there may have been some follow-up questions that you have been writing down. Well, I wrote a lot of things down, but I think I kind of want to go to normalizing survivorship to give people a context of what in the world is going on in my body when I feel mm -hmm. reactions to things that are known or unknown to me. And I guess the longer question is the complicit or unintentional participants in systems of oppression. So you were talking about the survivors of that and on your website. And I think that is, I think it's scary for people to, who are not understanding oppression to start understanding it uh, because there is, there is a part that's like, well, am I also, because I like this product or this bank or whatever, am I participating mm -hmm. in a system of oppression and how do I not participate? But I don't know what to do about it. Right. And then of course the people that are obvious victims or uh, survivors of, of many forms of oppression are more like aware of it. Right. So how do we both normalize survivorship for those who, who don't know that they're survivors and also those who obviously do and are ticked off about it. Right. And how do we, how do we talk to both groups is kind of what I've been trying to figure out. Um, especially in this context, I think in trauma informed counseling, we just had a conference on that here, which I was heading up it was a lot easier to get people to understand that. And then we did separate presentations for different groups and different types. And of course we did a whole, um, we did a whole presentation on the BIPOC community, you know, done by the BIPOC community about how the trauma affects them and, and how it affects them through all these different systems. But how do we, how do we do it for people that both know it, but, but, but all the people that have no idea that this is what's happening to them, they just feel, loss, like you said. So that was kind of part of my question to how do we normalize survivorship in my tangential mm -hmm. way? Yeah. So I think part of it is taking time to learn how, how our bodies work. Our bodies are set up really brilliantly to make sure that we can take our next breath. And we have a, a system called our autonomic nervous system that is a big kind of like core gear shifter transmission, if you call it maybe, to help us be able to navigate moments in which we have a felt sense of threat. It is a body-based system that uh, is so automatic that, um, and it is built to be automatic because if it took it, if, the autonomic nervous system needed to have a conversation with our brain to help us survive, we'd be dead. Um, so it does things automatically based primarily off of body sensations by our breath rate, by our heart rate. And so <clears throat> kind of commonly known 
percentages around like how much communication is verbal versus body to body. So that's about like 20% of the communication we'll have in a conversation is verbal and about 80% is my body talking to your body. So all the time our bodies are picking up on signals of my own breath rate, my own heart rate, your breath rate, your posturing, how close to you are me to me or not. We're also picking up on like changes in temperature in our body. We're picking up on sounds, smells, all of these things. And like the ways in which our bodies have figured out what is a threat and isn't um, is both based off of our lived experience in the body that we have right now, but as well as the epigenetic and genetic imprint from those who have come before us. So we have learned to figure out what is a threat and isn't based off of the information of our an ancestors as well. So <clears throat> with normalizing survivorship, um, what it comes down to is being able to notice first paying attention to our body, um, figuring out what are the signals that my body might give me that I feel a little bit off or I might not feel, you know, totally seen or heard or taken care of and figuring out what is my relationship with my own survival responses. And so those like main survival responses are a fight response, a flee, fight, flight, or avoid response, depending on what word you want to use for it, a freeze response. Um, a submit response or a fawn response. And all of those are incredibly adaptive that our bodies will pick up on our own internal signals and signals from the environment to choose which one is the most appropriate for me to get as far away from this felt sense of threat as possible. Um, the tricky part is that those systems engage both from a measurable threat that I can like say I like smell a kind of food that my perpetrator used to cook often. My body is probably going to be like, whoo, I don't feel safe. That's too connected. Or somebody's coming at me down the street and their body's moving in a way that real makes me realize like I got to get out of the way. Or all of those are automatic and natural responses. The more subtle ways that they play out though in interpersonal relationships are the ones that we haven't necessarily normalized. And quite often the ones that we talk about more frequently like our fight and our flight response um, are really only kind of like uh, accessible to folks who have a, bo a body that's big enough to execute, the execute those two responses or have a position of power in which we realize that like we won't be hurt by executing those two. So the latter three, I think, are a place that we as a collective of, of folks who are interested in pr providing space for healing to really, really normalize around like freeze, submit, and fawn. So freeze, we lock up, we can't speak. We feel like we can't take action. Um, our body might feel like cement. A submit response is where my body will soften and go along with the experience to make sure that I don't get harmed as much. So that may look like on a very concrete way where your body kind of softens in a car wreck or when you fall, um, as well as interpersonally, if I perceive that you have more power and you're trying to execute power over me, then I will follow along with you to make sure I can just like get through it. it happens quite often during sexual assault and other forms of interpersonal violence. And then fawning plays out in which if I perceive that I have less power in a situation, I might start to copy, emulate, um, or sort of, <clears throat> um, yeah, we'll say those two words. I was also thinking of acquiescing a little bit. Like, so somebody might be talking about some opinion that you don't agree with, but because of the power differential, you might go, oh yeah, okay, sounds good. I gotta go now. Like, And to normalize that that's a survival response that we're actually maybe not consciously choosing. Mm -hmm. um, we'll also not just acquiesce, but we'll copy. Um, so in the same way that if, if I'm victimized by somebody, I may copy their behavior to then victimize others. Older children will do it in family systems. Managers will do it if there's an abusive boss above them. Um, to the way, the way that likes, you know, um, any system of, of power, this will kind of like happen down the, the chain. And I think uh, people have to also understand in the autonomic nervous system, it's also quite automatic, meaning that yes. these things are happening normally. Yes. They have what I've been learning from the new traumas research and the neurobiology coming out of UCLA and other places with Dan Siegel is that a lot of these things happen so quickly that yep. then your brain has to make up a story as to why they happened later. 
which is why the trauma response and PTSD and other depression and anxiety post a traumatic event, a lot of people have made up a story that basically is uh, an anger at self or the world and so, because it's because it's too overwhelming and upsetting what happened. And so they have to make up a story, which ne- which actually is a negative story normally about themselves being like, I wasn't good enough. I couldn't have, I should have done this. I could have done that. When in fact they were a victim of a crime or victim of a trauma and they couldn't have done anything to prevent it. Um, it was just happened, but we have our, our human narrative. We want to make up a story to that. And also the fawning one is, is real interesting to me because oftentimes you hear of, uh, you know, teenagers, um, or not even teenagers, but like little kids acting out sexually on each other. Right. And I think this one is a very important one to me, uh, especially little kids that are acting out sexually. They learn that somewhere, right. You know, they either were exposed well, to something. Yes and, yes and no. Well, yeah. I mean, some people are just experimenting, I suppose. But what I mean is that a lot of kids, if something happened to them, they might repeat it. Right. But then we're like blaming, I don't know, just something for like the under seven age group, something like that. What are your thoughts on that? I guess it depends on the situation, but. Yeah, I think that mm, just like a social commentary is that we have societally disconnected ourselves from our own sexuality so often that we like kind of assume that we shouldn't be sexual when we are naturally sexual in a lot of ways. Um, So I also want to hold a lot of space that you know, because that's a system of violence in and of itself, um, that if kiddos are learning to notice pleasure in their body, um, that it's more so systems that have tried to like own and control our sexual power that have limited us from being able to like encourage sexually healthy sexual development in kiddos. And also we do need to hold space for kiddos do get victimized sexually. So it's both and. <laughs> well, you're right. It is a both and situation. I guess I was thinking more of along the lines of actual sexual violence done by little children. Um, they usually don't pick that up. But I guess you're right. There, there, there's a whole. No- I, I don't guess you're right. I know you're right. There's a whole system that has basically turned sexuality into a negative thing this slash an villainized. ownership thing, mm-hmm. uh, ownership, villainized and controlled item that is only supposed to happen under certain circumstances under that are essentially controlling it. And that's been happening there. I don't know what book to quote on that, but there's, this has been going on for ever, but there are examples of times in history when it wasn't so, so this way. But uh, it, if you've grown up in the United States, most likely, unless you were in some sort of commune that I don't know about, you were probably subjected to thinking that your sexuality was wrong or should be controlled or all of that um a lot of shame you you know yeah living in a community in which sexuality was liberated um so i think um kind of including that and walking ourselves into being able to normalize survivorship um is recognizing that that is our nervous system trying to do its absolute best to take care of us it's not a place that we choose. Like you said, it's completely automatic. Um, and it is based off of the, the wisdom of picking up on both how our ancestors have figured out how to take care of things and also body to body in our lived experience and the body that we're in right now, how we've also been sort of like exposed to how do I take care of myself? How do I make sure that I take my next breath? Um, so the tricky thing is, um, So there's the space to be able to honor for survivors of systems of oppression, survivors of interpersonal violence and how those systems of oppression play out in our relationships, that those five survival responses are natural, adaptable forms of resilience. Um, And also that um, we can create a lot of opportunities for like health and balance through being able to offer opportunities to be able to oscillate to the other branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is our parasympathetic branch, in which we have opportunities for rest, restoration, um, digestion, cellular longevity, immune system function. um, And the oscillation between those two happens almost on every breath. 
but it also takes a hell of a lot of practice if for some reason we've grown up in environments and in relationships where we've been in flight, fight, free, submit, or fawn more often than not. We're going to have to work pretty hard to be able to create that balance. And that balance is created through every breath. Our breath is innervated along those two branches. Um, that in, if we breathe a breath pattern that we breathe during a moment of threat, our body will pop into flight, fight, freeze, or submit, or fawn. If we posture in a way, um, if we move our body in that way, we will also instigate that response. If we practice different forms of breathing and different forms of movement and different forms of relating to self and others that give us an opportunity to have a felt sense of, of presence, of connection, um, then we will create kind of that like healthy pendulum rock between the two. We need to be able to have our survival system pay attention for us, take care of us, protect us, and also for our own like holistic body health and brain function um, need to offer ourselves as often as possible an opportunity to be able to connect to any singular millisecond, second, minute, hour of being able to have a felt sense of ease and connection and turn on our parasympathetic nervous system. And, um, and so like, and those are like concrete acts of resistance um, that are absolutely necessary. The challenging part is that when we have been in flight, fight, free, submit, or fawn, because of our positionality, the way we've been positioned amongst systems of violence, opting into turning on our parasympathetic branch for that rest, digest, ease, and connection is going to feel threatening in and of itself. Because it's like, yo, this is new. Am I allowed to do this? Oh, wait, my ancestors, my ancestors might have gotten whipped, killed, incarcerated, for like not complying, not fawning, not submitting to systems that were perpetrating against us. So what does it mean for me to like take a nap? The nap ministry is a really cool um, online platform to pay attention to. Um, the nap foster- ministry? Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. I yeah. Love it. she's, a, she's a powerful black woman. Um, and I'm forgetting her name right now because I have a hard time with uh, proper nouns. Um, that points to rest as an act of resistance, particularly for the black community in the United States. Um, um, not as a fluff, but as a right, as a, um, and so I think to follow up as well with your question around like, so that's a kind of a gist of being able to like normalize survivorship, get to know what survival responses your body has opted into to be able to take care of you. Um, create relationship with them of understanding of like, that was what my body could do to make sure that I could still be here. Um, The other piece for folks who are more protected by systems of oppression. um, So the people that may not realize that they're involved in or complicit Mm -hmm. with, or. Because we won't. Go ahead. Yeah. Taking a stand. Well, they're in, they're in it and they don't know it and they don't know Mm -hmm. That, you know, I'm, I'm going to give an example real quick on, on this. Mm-hmm. So these are folks who may be like working uh, they're in the monetary successful realm, which is our uh, current God, I think, in the United States. One of the biggest gods is a God of money. And if you're successful in that, you may have a lot of ill effects and ease going on beneath the surface of what was happening to you. So just a couple of stats here. In uh, as of 2016, now this has risen steadily. I couldn't find the recent numbers. One in six Americans is on a psychiatric drug um, for at least six to 12 months of the year. Uh, so we have one of the, uh, if you compare us to other first world countries, a uh, very unhealthy population here. <laughs> very unhealthy. You can look that up. Um, we have more psychiatric documented problems. At, comparing to other first world uh, countries. And, because we're uh, founded on systems of violence. Yes. I, 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 and so we're what founded I'm saying, on systems of violence. But if you listen to <laughs> it, the people, but, but if you talk to people that are successful, quote unquote, in society, they're always worried about more. They're always worried about more. Like everyone I know that makes middle class and up, they're always worried about, do I have enough? Do I have enough? And that's not, they're not even at risk of losing their house or something or losing an apartment or losing a car or losing a job or losing, going homeless. These are people that are not at risk of that too much, right? But there's always this worry about that. So if one in six people are on psychiatric medications and then this, this is a quick fix, a band aid to kind of drug us up, right? And then how many people are 
using overusing um, alcohol and marijuana and cigarettes and and things like that, where they're misusing it to cope. And how many people are misusing over the counter medications? I ran into a situation recently where somebody had told me they were taking um, multiple Benadryl a day, and I had no, I, I didn't know that was a thing, right? So it, we're our drug problem in the United States. I could there's statistics on this. Listen to my other podcasts about drugs. There's plenty of them outrageously high, not just not, and I'm not against drugs or alcohol, but I mean the misuse and the overuse of these things, uh, the heroin opiate epidemic that's ravaged the, uh, rural community in the United States. Um, there is something going on here. And what we constantly do is say, Oh my God, those poor people, they shouldn't have done that. Uh, stop doing drugs. Just say no, just say no to drugs. Like what the what is like that's at some point are we going to realize that something is wrong with the the multiple layers of the way we function as a society um james hillman is one of my favorite psychologists of all time because he was such a muckraker and he um i saw him speak before he died but in his later books he basically was lambasting psychology and saying, you're sitting here listening to these people with these problems when, and helping them cope with society and cope with these, with this isolation and cope with this hyper individualism and cope with these unfair jobs and unfair wages and cope with all of this. Meanwhile, they're being told all these fanciful stories of rugged individualism and how this is the, we're the best country in the world. And yet, you, you psychologists are a bunch of assholes because you're making money off these people's pain when really you need to be taking what you've learned from psychology after about five to 10 years in practice and go get into politics. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and politics is a whole nother topic, but not really because it affects everything. Mm-hmm. The, funding, uh, the mm-hmm. funding of your local community schools, the, mm-hmm. fu- the, the, I, the, uh, like you were talking about the ability to take a nap. Our, our culture is not centered around parasympathetic activities. The only mm-hmm. parasympathetic activities I can think of that are popular are drinking a ton of alcohol, which then it's leads, to, which I know it temporarily <laughs> suppresses your nervous system, but then makes it worse right later and smoking tons of weed. Those seem to be the two most, because people say you sleep when you're dead, you got to go hustle. It's like in our, it's in the water. Okay. We're uh, 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 caffeine. I love caffeine. I know I'm an addict. There we go. But of caffeine, but it's, it's like the most, you know, we have coffee shops everywhere. It's, it's so we're addicted to the fight, flight, freeze, uh, submit fawn. And we don't even know it because it's, it's like been passed down. And then the systems in play keep the economics such that you're incentivized to continue to work as much as possible so that you never pay attention to your body. You have no idea what parasympathetic activities are. I mean, yoga studios are getting popular, right? But then everyone's oh, like, but oh, but there's so many problems because they replicate the same systems of violence. Oh, I know. I'm getting to that. Sean Korn, you can read her book about that. She talks all about that. She's a yoga teacher that talks about this exact topic and and how to deal with it in the body but uh, like the idea that i can go to a yoga studio and and somehow have time off work you know so anyway uh, you get what i'm saying so then the people that love this ideology i mean i'm sure they might be reading ann rand or something like that they 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 glorify this paint a picture of this some sort of it's like a it's like one of those timeshare people. Like I feel like half the politicians right now are like could be successful timeshare salespeople because it's like this bullshit, right? That they're they're preaching. And then here's the problem. Then it self-perpetuates. And then what do we do? We blame the victim. And who do we blame right now? What's the flavor of the month? Um, currently, we're fl- uh, blaming um, people protesting against police violence. Oh, let's blame those people. That's in the newspaper or the internet. Uh, and let's blame uh, whoever else we can find that is suffering from the same system that you set up. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's the ultimate gaslight, I guess, um, Mm -hmm. comments, (laughs) topics. I don't know. I don't know where to go from there. You, you tell me. (laughs) Um, I think probably to take a couple breaths for both of us. Um, cause there's no way to talk about trauma and oppression without feeling it. Um, so for those listening, um, it takes 
practice to be able to stay present while we're talking about violence. Um, and when we are able to like stay pretty balanced between like a sensation of like rest and ease and connection while still being like, yo, there's something to like pay attention to. Um, we'll be able to keep, uh, keep the kind of parts of our brain on that are necessary to be able to think about solutions. Um, so for both of us in this conversation, I just want to kind of take a pause to be able to recognize that like, based off of the things we're talking about, we're in our survival responses. So I think I was getting into fight. Oh yeah. Your fists were up. <laughs> <laughs> I get a little passionate sometimes about this stuff. A few times a day. <laughs> keeps me up at night. Um, so to like maybe return to, um, you know, for, for folks that are really interested in like beginning to pay attention or kind of getting shocked maybe by like, yo, whoa, or like, our country's built off of systems of violence. Like what the fuck am I supposed to do? How does this relate with me? Um, how might I say in recognizing that because of my race and my physical ability and my educational level and my access to financial resources, like, wow, shit, I've been protected. Damn. I have been protected from all of these systems of violence that, um, perpetuate modern day slavery through incarceration that, um, keep, you know, resources outside of like, uh, uh, how do I want to say it? Like from being able to enter in the schools of my children. Um, so when we, when we're in that place, we're like, dang, I've been protected. We've typically from that place of protection, been reassured that we are good people. That's another narrative that's within the United States where like you are good because you are not experiencing harm. You are bad if you are experiencing harm. Um, so folks who have been experienced, who held positionalities that have either been protected um, or some folks will call that being privileged as my own contention with the word privilege um, that we've been, and I'm going to include myself in this. I was raised with the idea that like, because I had it good, I was good. Um, yeah. So when we start to pay attention to the fact that like there are systems enacting violence, um, then that idea of self of being good gets challenged and the instant an idea of ourselves get challenged, then our survival response also clicks in. <laughs> if you challenge that somehow, like I didn't deserve the ease that I've had in my life, that I am somehow not as good of a person because I have not been able to pay attention to or see these systems of violence and acting on my fellow human. Um, I will employ those same five responses. I'll fight you to the death that like, no, I'm still a good human. And yes, I am still a good human. And also I have not prevented violence from being enacted on somebody else. Potentially. I haven't been part of the solution, the resolution of that violence. If I have just like, you know, gone along with it, if I've fawned to that system or if I've submitted to that system, um, but to be, so if we are people who are interested in like no longer wanting to complicitly participate in systems of violence by our inaction, then we are up to the challenge of figuring out how do I then become in a healthier relationship with my own flight, fight, free, submit, or fawn response to those systems of oppression and to being called out and called in to integrity around my relationship with such. Um, so our own negotiation of being able to maintain a pretty healthy oscillation between our survival response and a place of staying connected and present and keeping my whole brain on, um, which is only possible when we are in our parasympathetic branch, um, is our challenge. Our challenge to be able to like notice, oh, wow, I'm getting defensive. Oh, wow, I'm avoiding that topic because, whoa, if I was to actually stay present with learning about racism, I'd have to learn about all of the ways in which my family might have perpetuated it and I might have ignored it slash complicitly perpetuated by ignoring it. Um, so it's leaning into being able to be in physical discomfort and being challenged without limiting ourselves by going into our survival response. Um, Cause those survival responses um, limit us from being able to access the most sophisticated parts of our brain, our prefrontal cortex in particular, our medial, medial prefrontal cortex, which leads us into solution seeking, empathy, perspective taking, creativity, planning, um, and curiosity. 
all of those things that are necessary to create solutions and no longer perpetuate the patterns that our country was built off of. So that would be my place of encouragement. It all, both being able to normalize and hold space enough for the restoration of our nervous systems from having been a direct survivor of systems of oppression and also having been one that might have like been protected by and not paid attention to, the work's the same. Stemming from being able to stay present enough in my body that I can lean into creating solutions and not tapping out. Yes, and I think that is part of, I've got two comments, probably more, but we'll just start with two. <laughs> I think that's a great thing for people to start with. And I think that does lead to the personal, because we were talking a lot about the macro environment and and the, and the what we're swimming in here in the United States and the context of what was taught to us in school or most schools, I would say, versus what reality is. The reality is not this painted picture we were handed. Reality was much worse and terrible and complicated. Um, and is. And is, right. I just meant the history, right? Our history mm-hmm. our history classes are kind of a joke. Um, they're propaganda classes, essentially. Quick comment. The United States is still leading the world per capita of incarcerated people. Only second to Russia. We're all, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, what I mean is Russia is right behind us. So we're still winning. We're number one um, incarcerated people in the world here. Uh, you can look that up on the uh, prison policy site. Um, so that's telling us another thing, right? How we're handling, that's a whole nother pet peeve of mine. How do we handle people that have drug, drug and alcohol addictions instead of putting them in prison is not rehab, right? It's not mm-hmm. helping them rehabilitate, get back to society. How do we handle people that have gotten in trouble for doing and how something? do we? And how do we shape society to be a place in which folks can be in? Two things, I think. Um, in being able to normalize survivorship and our how our nervous system functions, we will turn towards engaging with actions and substances that give us a kickback that we can feel, that we can have some sort of impact to around, like, I can change the sensations in my body. So if I hold an identity that is consistently under risk um, for the way that I am, um, my body will consistently be in my survival responses. I will consistently be rocking adrenaline and cortisol, which tends to accelerate my body and overly fatigue my body, create a lot of muscle tension. Um, our, those two ke- neurochemicals are at the base for all of the chronic diseases that our, our country's trying to figure out, quote unquote, how to solve. So those are our main route towards wellness is being able to notice that within my own body, I have agency to be able to have some sort of impact that I can change how I can feel. Because we will lean towards using substances to get that kickback other than, or instead of being able to do it within ourselves and do it within our relationships. Um, it's a way of maybe gaining control back. And because if we don't, if we don't, agency. If we yeah. don't know any other way of doing it, because I don't mm-hmm. think I know I wasn't taught any sort yeah. of progressive muscle relaxation, breathing techniques, uh, nature bathing, whatever, until weirdly enough, when I was 17, our high school theater teacher started teaching us this stuff. And I was like, what is this? I feel so good. Like just like <laughs> doing this weird visualization of like breathing for half an hour. And I remember like my friend, what well, we all were laying on the floor of the theater, like, you know, uh, the theater room or whatever. And I remember my friend fell asleep and I was like, I feel, what is this? And that helped me start getting into meditation, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole nother story. But, um, what the hell? I mean, and I, I, so- I didn't come from, I, I came from, you know, I was pretty protected in some ways, um, because mm-hmm. of who I am and what I look like. Um, but this is people don't know. So what's the quickest fix to, if you feel bad, you do drugs, alcohol, substances, mm-hmm. caffeine, sugar, all of it, um, mm-hmm. which leads to inflammation, which leads to cort- ex- accelerated cortisol levels. And the other one, I can't remember <laughs> adrenaline. adrenaline. Right. Yeah. And then this leads to chronic illness. I mean, it's just right mm-hmm. there. So I want to lead it back to you, but I, I think you were starting to shepherd us towards the personal story, which I have a few comments on. Cause I accidentally went back to the macro with the prison comment. <laughs> Um, yeah, so being able to practice frameworks of like anti-oppressive relationships with ourselves and practicing trauma-sensitive relationships with ourselves allow us to be able to practice it with each other. 
and we build the macro. So the way our nervous system functions builds how we then create every other relationship organizationally, et cetera. Um, so being able to notice how my body's feeling, how I'm breathing and practice making choices moment to moment and noticing how those choices then feel. Oh, wow. If I shift my breath like this, or if I stretch my body like that, or if I go for this kind of walk, or if I ask for a hug, or if I'm like moving in this way, I start to notice that my choices have an, have, have an impact on my own sensations that I have agency over that, that I can change my neurophysiology. And the more often we do that with at a consistent pace and in a consistent way, we'll begin to make choices that offer us opportunities to be able to feel that way rather than just kind of like going along with our survival responses and tolerating. I also want to like highlight too, before we wrap up, that the only way in which violence can continue to be perpetuated is through the act of othering. So a big, huge place that if, for anybody who is interested in being of the solve that is going to create resolution um, is by being able to like see that whatever harm somebody else experiences is also harming me because we are we. Um, it is not just those people, that person. The more you separate from yourself, separate yourself from somebody who is experiencing harm, the more you'll be able to tolerate that they can experience it, but it's not happening to you. Um, so really purposely doing whatever we can to no longer other. Um, because the instant we other, we can disassociate from somebody else's pain. Um, we can disassociate from a system that's causing pain. And I would go even so far as to say that my, my biggest thing, point I try to hold myself accountable to and other people that are trying to make change is that we cannot other the people that are creating and upholding the systems of violence. Because I hear so, mm -hmm. it becomes this us versus them mm -hmm. stuff, and you know they're evil. And, and mm -hmm. Carl Jung said most people never really encounter pure evil. There's, there's, it's out there, right? But normally it's coming from some complexes. It's coming from opportunity. It's coming from un, uh, you know, power and uh, unchecked power. It's coming from. Uh, a narrative in the person's head that they actually think that they're doing the right thing, that they're actually helping, and that the people that are protesting against them or arguing with them are actually wrong. They think this. Now, they could be, uh, you know, completely delusional. I don't know. But but I do think there's, there's a, it, everything's on a sliding scale, including narcissism and including whatever, you know, so even people perpetuating violence, we have to be able to look at their human story and how did they get this way? What system and, and what accountability do they have? But what accountability do the people that taught them this also have? And then how do we, how, how are we accountable for that as well? Um, and so if you're going to make change, we have to go beyond the systems are oppressive because systems are always self-perpetuating. The system wants to, this, once a system's created, the system's sole purpose is to survive just like a human right these these systems we have are 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 concerned with their survival i mean i'm talking very macro again darn it okay but so <laughs> but we have to we can't other the whole system and uh -uh. we can't other the the people in the system we have to hear uh -huh. their stories and then we have to be able to reach out to them somehow to make a connection because if they're in a position of power and i'm not if i can connect with a person in power i could by changing a slight bit of their mind about something that could change the world faster than me screaming at them and tweeting at them all day about how stupid they are. That's not going to change anyone's mind. So. Back Cause that'll lead us to stay in our survival responses, defending self. That's and correct. that means that we're only operating from our base brain. And we're not actually operating from a place in our brain that allows us to know that we exist. Thus I can know you exist. That gives me access to like clear verbalization of my truth. And that gives me access to be able to think about things from multiple angles to be able to find a mutually agreed, like available solution. Um, it is the hardest, I think, and most valuable thing that we can do is to be able to stay present during discomfort and pain. 
because all of this leaning into creating change within systems of, of oppression and violence means that we will need to be feeling them to then know how to heal them. Um, and that takes a lot of neurological tolerance and capacity and like building up strength um, to stay tuned and toned within our nervous system for connection. Um, Which is very um, difficult. I, I want to point this out real quick for the personal story. We, uh, something you said a while ago was why people don't haven't figured out that they were in this system of white body supremacy and all of the things that happened in the United States. And one of the things I was thinking about, the reason that a lot of people haven't figured this out is because they haven't gone into their personal story. Their personal story of their family and what happened with them is undiscovered and possibly causing them angst, fight, flight, freeze response. Uh, an easy example is uh, uh, somebody who has parents, they have a strained relationship. Perhaps they came from a wealthy family. They didn't have to want for material goods, but they have this strained relationship that's undiscovered and undealt with, right? And that's affecting their nervous system. And that that plagues them and they don't deal with that. And then to even ask them to go to the larger level and look at this bigger system and can you make a change with your the position you're in is like daunting because they still haven't figured out what's going on with them and their own their own family relationship that's strained. And so um, like you're talking about these practices, these practices will naturally bring you into that solving state of mind where you're able to connect with others. And those practices can also help you on the, on the personal micro level as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously, um, anything you can do to, to have more knowledge and to figure out what your relationship is to your own story first, and then noticing how that's in the greater story. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was a barrier I noticed with, with people that I'd, I talked to that d had no idea about anything we've talked about in this entire podcast. I noticed that their origin story of their own personal life was somewhat unquestioned and yeah, undealt with. Disassociated from their own pain. Yes, exactly. So, and then their yeah. pain secretly, my, this is my theory for some of them that I was talking to, they blame themselves for their pain secretly mm -hmm. and they had to dissociate from that by other means so because unfortunately we don't get our whole brains when we're born they come on it takes fucking 25 years and so much happens and the way we integrate it is that if we feel like shit we're shitty yes the brain is not done developing till age 25 yep so and at the same time i think some of the ways in which we've been encouraged to navigate healing our own story do keep us kind of stuck um, and so I think there's like a, a yes. And I need to be able to practice noticing what my body feels like in relationship to me. And I need to practice noticing what my body feels like in relationship to other folks. And if I notice that I'm disconnecting, how did I learn how to disconnect? Um, and then how can I teach myself to connect and connect myself to the influence that I have within my environment? And I know that we could talk about this for hours because I do. I lead trainings that go from like 20 to 40 hours in length. So I know that I have longevity in this conversation. I'd be happy to have a second one with you if that's something you're interested in. And I'm also feeling a lot of gratitude for, for all the things that we've been able to talk about in our time. Yes, I think we got to a good introduction point. Uh, and yeah. the introduction point is that there will be links to the books mentioned in the notes there will be links to Morgan Vanderpool's website. And on your website, you offer a lot of things for people that aren't just near where you live. You're offering uh, trainings, I saw. Can you tell us a little bit about what you got to offer before we... Sure, yeah. Um, so what I've noticed is that the systems of care have been grown within the systems of violence. And within systems of care, a lot of us who are doing our absolute best work need to have a little bit of a stronger or a lot of it stronger foundational knowledge about our own survivorship and then how our nervous system's working within the care work that we're doing. Um, so I love being able to be available to organizations, teams, individuals about what does it mean to be a, a healthcare or social services professional and integrate an anti-oppressive and trauma-sensitive relationship with myself and with others. Um, 
And then I also offer um, like specific weekend long trainings for folks who are interested in learning about trauma sensitive movement and breath specifically. Um, and individual consultation, supervision, all that jazz. So you're a clinical supervisor for social workers as well. Mm -hmm. yep. And then um, also obviously therapy, uh, if you have time, you see clients <laughs> as well. Yeah. Okay. And Very cool. I'm primar primarily of service within my queer um, and trans community um, and to folks who speak Spanish. Awesome. Well, I'm so, I feel uh, very uh, happy to have spoken with you, Morgan, and learned so much from our conversation and your website. And I'm excited for people to, um, you know, people that don't live in Washington to email you and uh, get you on their podcast and also hopefully take your training. So actually that's something I'm going to probably talk to you about later. Um, Sounds good. And I, I'm excited for people who are, who are unintroduced to this topic. Um, there is a lot to learn and there's mm -hmm. no shame in learning there. And, yeah. and, and take your, take your time, go at your own pace, but understand that there are answers to a lot of, uh, and, and meaning in a lot of sociological things we talked about, but there are also things you can do right now just to start like that Morgan was discussing, um, and finding ways to normalize your own survivorship and get in touch with your own body and nervous system in a way that is going to help you on your journey. And yes, if you're so inclined, help everyone here mm -hmm. in our country, in our world, find a different way to be with each other. So. And before colonialism and capitalism popped onto this planet, there are so many beautiful indigenous and collective ways of being that hold things in balance. And we have so much to learn from that ancestral line as well. So I'm not reinventing the wheel, just getting to be a voice for the wise ones that have come before me. That is a very good point. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of examples to draw from. Yes. So. Thanks. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe or leave us a rating on iTunes. I really appreciate everyone listening, and please share this with people that you think may enjoy this. I really enjoyed my conversation with Morgan. I wanted to read something from their website. They said, This space is created for the badass survivors of and complicit slash unintentional participants in systems of oppression. For all of us desiring to create restoration for the impacts of complex trauma, we are here collectively. Identify the root causes of trauma and oppression. Unwire our relationship with white body supremacy and interlocking systems of oppression. Recode an anti-oppressive and sustainably healthful relationship with our nervous systems. Uh, they go on to say a lot of other things, but they will mix together the essentials of epigenetics, neuroscience, breathwork, body-based movement, restorative justice, and ecosystemic understandings to redesign our nervous systems. This helps us to establish the restorative and anti-oppressive connections. And when one can't breathe, we all can't breathe. There's a lot more to be said on their website. Uh, there is a little part I liked here, which was to effectively engage the 85% body to brain communication. It's our collective responsibility to learn the layered and intersectional impacts of complex trauma on our bodies, nervous systems, brain functions, and relationships, which most of our educational and professional training leave out. And I can vouch for that as I've talked a lot about, I didn't even hardly learn about trauma in my training, uh, let alone 
how it connects to the larger world. When we center the body in trauma restoration work, we gain access to 85% of our power to heal and to 85% of the conversation guiding our moment-to-moment survivorship experience of interlocking systems of oppression. Gratefully, by keeping nervous system work at the center of anti-oppressive work, we can distill our focus to the functionality of five survival responses. Offering unprecedented simplicity and efficacy in creating the foundation for anti-oppressive work. And I think they made a very good point, even in the interview. I got a little fired up into my fight complex, and I had to kind of calm down and take their lead as they appeared quite grounded the entire time. Not sure they were, but um, from what I could see in the video, they were, and it was very helpful to me. So that makes me think, if you're an organization or an individual, there are trainings that Morgan will offer online, um, obviously in person, when we can. Uh, So, check out their website. If you are looking for an Emdria consultant, I'm finally starting my Emdria uh, consulting group for EMDR therapy in January of 2021. For details, check out www.healthforlifegr.com or counselingsupervisorgr.com. And now for the disclaimer. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and the guests that they interviewed. And while these opinions are based upon literature they have read, their experience in life, and the field that they work in, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinions on this or any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed, or overwhelmed? Text Steve, that's S-T-E-V-E, to 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. Uh, Morgan, of course, uh, is working in the state of Washington, and you can find them and their details out at their website that I will have in the show notes. You can also make an appointment if you are in the state of Michigan with the excellent clinicians at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids. Thanks to the telehealth capacities, most insurance companies are now allowing telehealth sessions to be counted as a regular session. So you can call us at 616-200-4433. That's 616-200-4433. Or visit us on the internet at www.healthforlifegr.com and schedule an appointment with one of our clinicians. And if you're in Grand Rapids, you may be able to actually see them in person depending on the situation. The Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association is working to increase the availability of quality mental health services statewide, increasing education, promoting best practices, and working to keep licensed professional counselors and other professionals accessible by the public. We need you to get involved with the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association or the American Mental Health Counselors Association or the American Counseling Association or all of the above to make sure that we are promoting mental health not just in the clinics, but in schools and other in workplaces and, and other places in the state and in all of the states as we are in a mental health crisis right now and we've been in one for years. So hopefully somebody listening will eventually work on some policies to help us all live better. But if not, you've got to come to counseling therapy to get help. We're here for you. Thanks so much for listening. This has been Paul Krauss of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I got angels running away. I got demons hunting me. I know pop with 25. I know Jesus 33, I tell death to keep a distance, I think he obsessed with me, I say God that's the one, I know she would die for me, they want a barcode on my wrist. 
to auction off the kids that don't fit their description of a utopia. Like a problem won't exist if I just don't exist. If I grew up without a single pot to piss and pardon me for venting, Congress got the nerve to call itself religious. Rich just getting richer. We just trying to live our life. Mama mixed the vodka with the sprite. They killed my cousin with the pocket knife. While my uncle on the phone, he was going for more to have my life. He got out of year and then he died. I was on the road, talking to my father on the phone. Left the city when I was just born. None of them would get along. Mama begging him for winning coast. I was chilling with my niggas boot. Now they trying to take a side. Don't mean shit to a nigga that ain't never had shit. Yeah. I got my granddaddy soul. I'm at war, that's on my mind. I see want to buy the cool. Wish I could switch you with mine. I'm not worried about no rap shit. Distractions always waste of times. I still go to social functions, even though I'm so anti. No, I'm no Rihanna in the court, gonna throw it like Donna. Been down a bit, I just been modeling my whole career as a park was a studio monitor to shake. And I raised the apartment to bond over profit. I made what I made and a lot to. Amount of time, the same amount of time you was watching. So stop comparing me to people, no, I am not them. A lot of people dreaming till they shit against shit. That's nice. My mom makes it rock with the sprite. Kill my cousin with the pocket knife. I'm a on the phone, he was gone for more than half my life. He got out of year and then he died. I was on a roll, 